Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. If the rapture is the next prophetic event, and the rapture is without signs, it could happen at any moment. It's imminent. And I live under the overhanging reality of that, and that should decide my decisions. That should shape my thinking and the course of action. It should help me decide what I'm going to give my money and time and energy to. But on the other hand, the rapture won't happen in a vacuum because it is a trigger event. Spiritual readiness isn't something you can borrow at the last minute. Welcome to Know the Truth, where today, Philip DeCourcy explores Matthew 25, explaining what it means to be truly prepared for Christ's return and why personal spiritual preparedness is crucial. We're learning how to avoid the trap of complacency and cultivate a life of watchful anticipation. It's an urgent wake-up call for believers titled Ready and Waiting from the famous short story series. To replay part one, visit ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, a message I've called Ready and Waiting. We're in a series, if you're joining us for the first time, on the parables of Jesus. We've called it Famous Short Stories. Now, we're going to focus today on just being alert and ready and awake to the reality of Jesus' second coming. When it comes to the second coming of Jesus and the eternal state, I do not want to be known as Philip the unready. I do not want for that day to overtake me. I don't want to be found sleeping at the wheel. No, when Jesus comes, I want to be found alert to the lateness of the hour, alive to the priorities of God's kingdom, attuned to the prophetic significance of events that are happening around me, aware of my personal accountability to God and afraid of losing my full reward in the life to come because of prayerlessness, carnality, ill discipline, or a failure to take up my cross. And so given that concern and given that compulsion, let's turn to Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the parable of the ten virgins or the bridesmaids. It's part of our series on the parables famous short stories. And here's a short story told by Jesus, calculated to promote readiness on the part of those who are alive when he returns to the earth at his second coming in part and glory to establish the millennial kingdom. In fact, you see this in verse 13. The point of the story is simple and clear. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So the intent of this parable, along with the parables either side of it, is to call us to a state of readiness. So let's look at this parable. I've got a simple outline. We can almost take this outline and apply it over every parable we're going to preach. I haven't done that, nor will I. But here's a good little outline. If you're a preacher, this is what you want to do with the parable. The parable, the point, the practice. Let's look at the parable. What's the point? There's usually one central theme and thrust. And then what is the application, the practice that comes out of it? Let's look at the parable. The challenge is to be ready for the bridegroom's return. Now, before we go any further, let me remind you that this is a parable, not an allegory. Because often commentators and Bible scholars are tempted to look at this story and draw all kinds of significance to the word midnight, which has no prophetic significance. It's just telling us that the bridegroom is going to arrive at an unusual hour. Uh, Who are the virgins? What is the oil? And they get into all this kind of elaborate interpretation. But as I've said, this is not an allegory. It's a parable, and most parables have one central theme and thrust, 
And we get in in verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the hour or the day in which the Son of Man is coming. Because when the bridegroom comes, some of the virgins are caught, you know, unprepared. They don't have enough oil. And that's the point of the story. We don't need some fanciful interpretation. So you get the point. I think I quoted this early on in the series, Gary Enrig. Although the details may have symbolic significance, more commonly a parable is intended to teach one main point. Therefore, we need to seek to grasp the truth firmly and not wander into the lush forest of speculation trying to assign meaning to secondary details. Don't do that. Just it's a simple story. Some people were prepared and other people weren't prepared. And the point is, are you prepared? Simple as that. That's the division. Secondly, we've got the delay. The bridegroom's delay was not unheard of. We mentioned this, the dowry, the negotiations, the financial arrangements. Sometimes there were some last-minute negotiations that went on. And that may well be what's going on here. But there's a delay And therefore, there was a challenge and a call to greater vigilance and renewed anticipation on the part of the bridesmaids. They anticipated the bridegroom's coming. Then something kind of put that on pause. Was it a negotiation over the diary? We don't know. But the bridegroom was delayed in his coming, verse 5. And so they all slumbered and slapped. They all did that, even the wise. That's just telling us they were taking a little nap. That's not really at the heart of the story. The issue is, were they going to be ready and uh, alert when the bridegroom did come? I think Jesus is reminding us that should the passage of time go by from the Mount of Olives discourse to the moment he actually returns, will our focus fade? Or will we keep the thought of his return and the events that surround it and the consequences that follow it? Will we keep that to the front of our mind or will it begin to fade? That's the danger of the delay. Okay? We all know that temptation that the longer you have to wait for something, your attention span may shrink and your focus might fade. And that's what Jesus is warning us about. Listen to John MacArthur. The statement that the bridegroom was delaying reinforces Jesus' teaching that a second coming to the earth will be unexpected. It will not be delayed from a divine perspective, but from a human one. But the main thrust of the parable, like the main thrust of the entire discourse, is directed to the generation who will be living during the latter part of the Great Tribulation. Even the short period of time that will lapse between the signs of his coming and the actual appearance will cause some to think the Lord is delaying his return. On the church age side of it, in terms of secondary application, it's just a reminder to us to, to stay awake. We'll get, come back to this, to the any moment return of Jesus. Robert Murray McShane a Presbyterian pastor in Scotland who was an avid premillennialist and a lover of the nation of Israel. He, he was in a, a minister's meeting one night and, and just, had, I think, had sensed in his own day a lack of prophetic interest. And so he asked each of the ministers that night if they thought Jesus could come back that day, that night. And some hemmed and hawed and some kind of gave a distant stare and some articulated that they didn't think that, and that was the basic feel of the room. No, it's unlikely that Jesus would come back today. And Robert Murray McShean quoted Matthew 24, 44, the tax the Lord used to bring me to Christ, the tax that kind of preempts this parable on the ten virgins. And he said, in such an hour as you think not, gentlemen, the Son of Man comes. And it's keeping that kind of perspective alive that this parable is promoting. Thirdly, the dereliction. We're under the parable. We've got the distinction or the division. We've got the delay. We've got the dereliction. This is verses 6 through 12. The bridegroom comes, 
And the bridesmaids rise to meet him. But with the passage of time, the lamps of the foolish were going out. Look at verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So they made no preparation for the delay. They didn't anticipate the delay. Verse 8, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. That's in the present tense in the Greek. Their lamps would soon be out of oil. That was not where you want to be when the procession back to the bridegroom's house is about to take place. So they, they were to trim their lamps upon hearing that the bridegroom's coming and they were to go out to meet him. So verse 7, the, the virgins arise to trim their lamps and some were able to do it and some weren't able to do it. We talk about trimming the lamps here. If it, it might have been a, a small lamp with a wick on it that would be cut and then extra oil would refill the base. But more than likely, these are more torches than lamps. The Greek seems to indicate they're more torches. A long stick with some rags or clothing or material on the end of it. And as that kind of started to go out, you would just add more oil to that and keep it burning. And that seems to be the picture we have here. And sadly, half the group were out of oil and had to go and buy some, and they lost their spot. They lost their opportunity to be part of the procession and the feast. In contrast, the wise, verse 4, had taken extra oil and had anticipated a delay, and they were ready and, and waiting for the bridegroom and the call to go out to meet him. And that's the point of the parable, right? It's picking up on Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. It's midnight. The bridegroom's coming. Unexpected. In fact, they were sleeping. But at least those wise bridesmaids, virgins, were ready. And they had oil enough. And they weren't shut out of the kingdom which is the implication of this story for those who weren't ready, who go and get the oil. They buy it, but at this stage, the procession has come and gone. They're in the house. The door has been shut, and they're locked out of the kingdom, lost, with no opportunity to fix that. Now, a little sidebar, because I think there's an interesting aspect to this story and that is the unwillingness of the five wise virgins to share their oil with the five foolish virgins. And that maybe our instinct is to, that's really unkind. That's unloving. Why didn't they share their oil with those who had run out of oil so that they might join the procession? And initially, there was no panic on the part of the five foolish virgins because others had oil and maybe they had this idea that indeed they could borrow it. But when you get to verse 9, the wise answered and said, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you, go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Basically, the wise is saying this, Look, we have extra, but we need the extra. And if we share it with you, the chances are none of us will get to the feast without the lamps going out. So why should we all get shut out? Why should we pay for your mistake? And the point of the parable, I think, in that little interesting part of the story is that this is a parable of preparedness, and this is a parable of personal preparedness. Leon Morris in his commentary and Matthew says, being ready for the second coming of Christ is not something that can be shared or passed on. It's an individual matter. David Garland in his commentary and Matthew said this, one might think that the wise maidens should have shared their supply of oil with those who were ill provided so that all might enter together into the feast. But the parable is an allegory about spiritual preparedness not a lesson on the golden rule. 
Spiritual readiness is not something that can be transferred from one to another. The point is that one must take steps to furnish oneself with oil before going to sleep while one has the chance. I love that. That's the challenge, isn't it? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to each give an account for the things done in the body. Philippians 2, 12 to 13, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. I like what old Bishop Lightfoot says, there are some things that must be bought, they cannot be borrowed. Character is like that. It cannot be loaned from person to person. Character is something that must be developed individually, forged by one's own meditations and by one's own decisions. A great man died the other day. He lived long and well through the years. He had planted his roots deep in the soil of proper conduct. He had become a veritable moral force for right. What a pity that his strength of will and his love of goodness could not be transferred to those who were at his bedside, but character cannot be bequeathed. Lightfoot goes on, obedience to God is another thing that cannot be borrowed. Here each one is accountable individually. The husband cannot stand for the wife, nor the wife for the husband. All the faith and dedication in the world of parents is not enough for the children, and all the hope and enthusiasm of a boy or a girl cannot suffice for an indifferent father or mother. The plain truth is that God expects personal obedience of His commands because He holds every man personally accountable and responsible for what he does. Love that. Godliness can't be borrowed. It's yours to pursue. To be born in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. You must decide for Christ. You get the point? Daniel Webster, the great American statesman, was once asked what was the greatest thought that ever had entered his mind, to which he replied, my personal accountability to God. Is it not the primary thought? Is that not the thought that should shape us in the daylight and keep us awake in the night hours? Someday I will stand face to face with the Lord God Almighty and give an account for every moment, every hour, every day, every action, every thought. And on the basis of that, my eternal reward will be decided. Not my salvation, because that's a gift. Righteousness is imputed by faith alone. But what we do in the body has eternal significance. So you and I need to be awake and alert to that. Christianity is not a private thing. It is a personal thing, but it is something you must own. I hope your Christianity isn't a religious hand-me-down from your fathers or your culture or your upbringing. I hope it's yours by choice, by conviction, by conduct. I remember um, a pastor friend of mine shared with myself and the staff that of his son, that he'd got a call from his son who was kind of nowhere with the Lord and, and a burden to the family. And, and the father called him. He was away on, at a school. And, and here's what he said, Dad, I've been living off everyone else's Wi-Fi, but now I have got my own password and I'm living five bars. Now, what he meant, he's talking about faith there, spirituality. I've been living kind of off you and mom and everybody else, but it was never mine. And I've stopped living off everyone else's Wi-Fi. I got my own password and I'm living five bars. I hope that's true of you. This parable would challenge you to that end. Let's move on and we'll get quick here. The parable, the point, point simple, I've already said that self-explanatory. Verse 13, watch for you don't know when Jesus is coming. Watch for you don't know when Jesus is coming. That's a thread that has been sewn into the fabric of this text. I mean, in the parable of the fig tree, when its branch has already been become tender and put forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. This generation will not pass away till all these things have taken place. There's going to be a generation alive in the time of the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus, 
in the establishment of the millennial kingdom, and they're going to see it all happen. And they need to be awake to that and alive to that. And then we've got this in verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the hour nor the deaths. Don't be distracted by the things of the world. Don't be dead to the priorities of the kingdom. The call of Jesus to his audience was to be alert, alive, and awake toward God during the interval between Jesus' first coming and second coming. And here's the point. This is a lifestyle and this is a mindset that cannot be achieved by last-minute adjustments. It demands a constant practice and a long-term provision. Like the five virgins, they played the long game. They had enough oil. They could sleep because they were tired. But when the bridegroom came, they could awaken. They had oil. They were ready. Their life was in order. They didn't have to make any last-minute adjustments. They'd been anticipating this. They'd been living for this. And they were ready for it when it came. And my friends, so should you and I. And I'm going to get to that in the practice. So before I leave this thought of the point, remember, contextually and prophetically, we're dealing with the generation of Jews that will be alive at Jesus' coming. And I think the intent of this parable is that there's an invitation to join Christ and His bride, the church, during the festivities of the millennial kingdom. See, Jesus will return with the church at the second coming, Revelation 19, to set up His kingdom. There'll be the judgment of the Gentile nations separating the sheep from the goat, Matthew 25. And then those who are wise within the nation of Israel will enter the kingdom. Those who are foolish will miss it. That's where we're at. A timely and urgent call to be ready and waiting from Pastor Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth. Today's lesson is from our famous Short Stories series, a study on the parables of Jesus. And if you miss any part of this series so far, you can access it online at ktt.org and on the KTT app or podcast. Well, today's lesson was titled Ready and Waiting, a lesson on living each day with our eyes set on eternity so that when Christ suddenly returns, we are not unprepared. And to help you with this goal, we're offering a book by John D. Gillespie titled Following Jesus in an Age of Quitters, The Resolutions of Jonathan Edwards for Today. This insightful book explores 70 resolutions of Jonathan Edwards, applying their timeless wisdom to our modern world, and helping you cultivate a life of unwavering faith and commitment. Through 70 engaging devotionals, you'll discover how Edwards' resolutions can guide you in developing spiritual disciplines, including persistent prayer. Each reading includes one of Edwards' original resolutions, a relevant Bible passage, Gillespie's commentary, and a verse or quote for reflection. This book will inspire you to stay steadfast in your faith, even when circumstances tempt you to give it up. You can request your copy now by giving a gift of any amount. Just call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. And thank you for remembering that Know the Truth is a listener-supported ministry. Your support allows us to share the gospel with a world in need of truth, encouraging believers through radio, internet, printed resources, and even through special events. Philip, you've got one right around the corner. Yes, October the 7th at Alta Vista Country and Golf Club in Placentia, California. I'll be hosting the first annual Know the Truth Golf Tournament and Dinner, and you're invited. I hope you'll join me and others. To learn more about this event and register, visit KTT. Dot org. Again, that's ktt.org. Well, that's our time for today. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Be sure to join us tomorrow when we'll continue this message. We'll be learning more about the difference between merely waiting and actively watching for Jesus' return. That's Friday on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.